Hello and welcome to this second video of three on Voltaire's Candide. In the previous video we kind of got the more dusty philosophical context of Leibniz and Pope out of the way, and in this video I'll be looking at the names of the characters before giving you an example of analysing one of the characters, character analysis, and also analysing a specific passage in the text. Let's start though with the significance of the names. I'm thinking here of a Latin term for a pre-modern concept, really, nomen et omen, the idea that a person's name either predicts or actually influences their character and what happens to them. Our story begins in the beautiful country of Westphalia, in the baronetcy of the Baron Tondertontronke. It is a thoroughly German-sounding name and incorporates the English word thunder, it also has lots of quite harsh T's in it, tonder ton tonk, alluding therefore to the tempestuous atmosphere of war and pillaging that soon engulfs the castle. Candide, in contrast, is a much softer sounding name and distinctly French. Candide is exactly that, he is candid, he is innocent. The word Candide itself means unsophisticated, credulous, naive, trusting. And in Voltaire's day it also had that negative connotation of gullibility. And in the first chapter our narrator even goes into how Condi got his name, because we read in that opening chapter that sa physionomie annonçait déjà son âme. Il avait le jugement assez droit, avec l'esprit plus simple. C'est, je crois, pour cette raison qu'on le nommait Candide. <coughs> so this is a man who starts by believing gullibly, in the optimistic philosophy of the best of all possible worlds. And if you don't know what that means, it means you've skipped video one and need to start there. But he's also candide, he's also a lump of clay, ready to be moulded into shape by experience, by lived experience. The Latin candidus, after all, means white, pure, sincere. And so we might also consider Candide to be a kind of blank canvas, a blank canvas who observes the world erode his confidence in the notion of a best of all possible worlds, that, that, that undifferentiated totality of good drummed into him by his tutor, Pongloss. <coughs> Pongloss himself, that comes from the Greek pan, all, and glossa, tongue. Now that doesn't mean that he's a polyglot, so a speaker of several foreign languages, rather it means that Pongloss is all talk. He's a boring old man, obsessed with grammar and useless knowledge, and his role is to show the stupidity of the optimist view, because no matter what happens to him and to Candide during the text, he will always continue to be loyal to Leibnizian notions of deistic determinism. That was a lot of big words. Um, the, the idea that God has set everything in advance for us and we can't stop him. And so that again shows just how tunnel visioned he actually is. How blind he is. He's literally blind because he loses an eye and an ear to syphilis. He's also hanged and, and somehow survives the execution. And then also has his body surgically cut open from his shoulder to his belly button and... Uh, survives that as well. The object <coughs> of Candide's affections is Cunigonde. In Cunigonde, or perhaps in an English accent, Cunigonde, we see the Latin cunus for vagina and the French suffix grande, which I won't uh, expand on further. Despite being a beautiful noble girl at the beginning of the tale, Cunigonde is slept with, prostituted, and raped from pillar to post over the course of the tale. She is, in other words, very much characterised by her sexuality and by her physical features. But it would be wrong to see her only in this light, because in truth she is also a ruthless survivor, as indeed is the old woman, La Vieille. Cunigorn's function in the text is to be a plot driver, 
to drive Candide's ambition to return to her. And there are, of course, other important characters. So we have Cacambo, the loyal mixed race man who remains relatively positive throughout the text and who encourages Candide to improve himself. So Cacambo is often seen as a mouthpiece for Voltaire, the writer. We have La Vieille, who has very much formed her views based on a wealth of really quite negative life experiences, and so on it goes. <clears throat> so let's look at some examples now of what it might mean to analyse a character. And for that, I'd like to skip, if I may, to the end of this text and look at Candide. By the end of the tale, when Candide is deciding what to do with the young baron, Cunigon's brother, whose last name then must also be Tonderton-Tronque, we see that Candide consulta Pangloss, Martin et le fidèle Cacambo, rather in a way that a king might consult his royal advisers. My question then is this, why is Candide the man in charge at the end of the text? Because he certainly isn't the most learned, educated, he or the oldest, or the most noble, or the most practically useful person in the merry crew, or not so merry crew as it turns out at the end of the tale. <coughs> and Candide, as far as I can see, has three trump cards over the other characters by the time they make it to the Constantinople small holding, the, the, the farm. Firstly, he has wealth. Although we learn that he has nothing left but the little farm itself, we can still guess that this gives him a greater amount of wealth than the other characters. Secondly, Candide, this soft, gullible man, is in fact a trained soldier, an accomplished swordsman, a good shot, and a cold-thinking, seasoned killer. Just think about it. He's given military training by the Bulgars in chapter two, and his teachers regard him as something of a, of a prodigy. He kills Isaacar and the Inquisitor in chapter nine by instinctive reflex, and then he has the presence of mind to think logically about how to escape the situation. So, you know, if this were, if you do a modern telling of Candide, Candide would be one of those killers who would think to wipe away all the forensic evidence at the end. Uh, in chapter 10, his training impresses the general so much that he's made a military captain and given men to command. In chapter 15, he kills the baron's son, uh, who then comes back to life. In chapter 16, he shoots the monkeys in South America when they're busy frolicking with their human lovers. You heard me right, that's chapter 15, do look it up. So perhaps he's really not quite so condied so innocent and inexperienced and uneducated, after all. <clears throat> and if you think that was unexpected, let's not forget, this is my third point, Candide literally owns the other characters. He frees Martin Pangloss, La Vieille, and the Baron's son from slavery, meaning that he has technically purchased them as slaves for himself. Cacambo was already his servant, Cunigonde, as his wife, is his possession in 18th century French uh, logic. So when you think about it, he does kind of have ownership to an extent over the others. Now, the text at no point suggests that he continues to keep the others as slaves, but neither does it explicitly say that he has granted them their freedom. Candide, then, by the end of the tale, is king of his own little world. He owns the land, he owns the people, and his violent tendencies to kill, and his kind of uh, previous scorecard in terms of the people he's bumped off, probably keeps the others from wanting to square up to him. His only possible challenger is the Baron's son, who has a legitimate fraternal claim over his sister Cunigonde. In other words, he's the brother, so he can help decide what happens to her. 
He also has superior aristocratic blue blood flowing through his veins. And in response to that, Candide, like a baby cuckoo, pushes that rival to his authority, the Baron, out of the nest in the Constantinople uh, farm, and his status thus remains unchallenged. Candide, when you think about it, hasn't really learned anything, and in some ways he even seems a little like the tyrannical king that Voltaire may have sought to critique. So those are just a few of the somewhat less obvious things that you might say about Candide's character. So that's a character analysis. Let's have a stab at analysing a passage. And I'd like to look at chapters 17 and 18, which are the El Dorado passages. They're at a midpoint <coughs> in the text, both physically, because they're chapters 17 and 18 out of 30, and also thematically, because you can really divide this text, it's quite good that this edition is in green, into three different garden spaces. The idyllic kind of Garden of Eden that is Westphalia's Tonde de Tontonque, then El Dorado, and then the Garden of Constantinople. El Dorado, then, is this mythical land bursting with gold and jewels. And it seems that Voltaire was influenced in part by the early British colony, this time in North America rather than South, of modern-day Pennsylvania. Candide and Cacambo um, learn that engineers who are kind of employed to build a flying machine for them, they're paid pas plus de 20 millions de livres sterling, monnaie du pays. Now, why on earth is El Dorado using the pound sterling? Well, we know that at the time Voltaire was working on a book about world history, and a chapter of this dealt with Pennsylvania, and Voltaire was really quite impressed with Pennsylvania, because he says that it had an atmosphere of freedom and enlightenment. <coughs> and so, in the English translation of Voltaire's Essai sur les Meurs here, he says there are no other dogmas in Pennsylvania except what was uttered by Penn, so the founder of Pennsylvania, so that almost everything came down to loving God and human beings. No baptism, no priests, no judges, no doctors. And when we compare this to El Dorado's lack of prisons, lack of judges, lack of priests, and the fact that for some reason they've got pound notes in their pockets, it seems to me that Voltaire was inspired by this real-life location. <coughs> Chapter 17 ends with Voltaire, with Candide, saying, Et quoi qu'on dit, Maître Pangloss, je me suis souvent aperçu, souvent aperçu, que tout allait assez mal en Westphalie. And so here, Candide not only challenges his tutor's view, Pangloss's, but also claims to have an alternative world view, and also the fact that Candide, by saying souvent, is there perhaps here a line of an admission of complacency? In other words, Candide admitting that he always knew that his teacher Pongloss was talking a load of nonsense, and that he just basically went along with it to be polite. In chapter 18, notice how Voltaire uses the language of, in, of simplicity in an ironic way, because in El Dorado, the kind of the streets are paved with gold and jewels. Ils ont très, that's a past historic, dans une maison fort simple, car la porte n'était que d'argent, et les lambris des appartements n'étaient que d'or, l'antichambre n'était, à la vérité, incrustée que de, euh, de rubis et d'émeraudes, etc. Note that ironic extreme simplicité. So it serves to demonstrate here that in the minds of old Rardens, those precious stones, the fact that in the Western world we're obsessed with money, it actually means nothing in an ideal society. I say that, but actually El Dorado offers idealised concepts beyond the material. So we have a king who likes his visitors to kiss him rather than to fall at his feet and worship him. A palais des sciences, so valuing uh, education. <coughs> and so it all might seem quite rosy in the El Dorado garden. But is that really the case? Well, 
let's pay attention to language and to subtle little things that we might otherwise miss. Because we learn early in chapter 18 that El Dorado has inhabitants, it's the ancient city of the Incas, qui en sortirent très impudément pour aller subjuguer une partie du monde et qui furent enfin détruits par les Espagnols. And this is followed by a remark that's easy to gloss over, <coughs> which is actually quite important. Les princes de leur famille qui restèrent dans leur pays natal furent plus sages. Ils ordonnèrent du consentement de la nation qu'aucun habitant ne sortirait jamais de notre petit royaume. Et c'est ce qui nous a conservé notre innocence et notre félicité. These lucky people of the supposed ideal space of El Dorado aren't allowed to leave. True, this was originally voted on in the days of the Incas, but we can assume that several centuries has passed by since they took that vote. Now that really was a once-in-a-lifetime referendum. El Dorado has shut itself away, not for political or economic reasons, but for notre innocence et félicité. Now, at best, that seems to be a strong condemnation of multiculturalism. They're keeping themselves pure from outsiders. <clears throat> this, from a country that we infer, is meant to be a tolerant one. When he's asked about monks, the old man responds, Nous sommes tous du même avis. A statement which seems to exclude not only any form of democracy, but also any arena for spiritual or intellectual debate. All of a sudden, El Dorado starts to seem less of an Enlightenment society and more of a totalitarian one. We might even detect a menacing tone in this following remark. Je n'ai pris assurément le droit de retenir, uh, je n'ai pas assurément le droit de retenir des étrangers, c'est une tyrannie, n'est ni dans nos mœurs, ni dans nos lois. Tous les hommes sont libres, partez quand vous voudrez. Personne ne pourra vous accompagner, car mes sujets ont fait, ont fait vœu de ne jamais sortir de leur enceinte, et ils sont trop sages pour rompre leur vœu. So here the king is saying that El Dorado's subjects are either too docile to even think about escaping El Dorado, or they're so fearful of the king that no one dares to disobey. So certain readers across history, of course, would have felt more strongly about this negative reading than others. So a Cold War reading of this part of Condide would very much relate to belonging to a highly monitored state where citizens of the Soviet re uh, Union had limitations on what we would now call freedom of movement, as of course perhaps would readers in North Korea today. Considering the way in which El Dorado's economy is regulated, the notion of civic duty and the relationship between citizen and state would also do quite a good communist or Marxist reading of El Dorado. <coughs> and so clearly El Dorado is not a perfect world. It's a land not of this world, because it has loads of rubies and emeralds everywhere. It has fast-running blue sheep. It has men who are 172 years old. And so, rather than being a practical blueprint for a real-life society, I'd say that, shrouded in a kind of semi-utopian haze, it is perhaps the spirit of El Dorado, its freedoms, its hospitality, its deism, that Voltaire intended to impress upon us with this myth's mystical city. But for now, such wisdom, wisdom is beyond our heroes, because Candide still wants his girl, and both of them realise that the small amount of wealth that they've been given in El Dorado, on the backs of those cute little fast-running blue sheep, who, who sadly get killed later on, hashtag spoilers, that wealth is enough to make them filthy rich back in Europe. So remember what I said about character analysis, you know, Candide hasn't learnt that um, material wealth isn't what we should pursue in life. By the time he gets out of El Dorado, he's all about the money still. 
The day when they learn how to be content with their lot and to do the best to improve themselves in their present situation is still several chapters away. And it's on the subject of those concerns and wider themes spanning across the whole book to which we shall turn in our final video. I hope you'll join me for that. I'll see you then.